Hello, welcome everybody to another episode of Transfigured. I am here again with Father Stephen DeYoung. This is his second appearance on this podcast. And I should also just remind people, if you're like, Sam, I really wish you had a podcast version instead of just a YouTube channel. I already do. And I get that question every once in a while. So just go search on your favorite podcast app. If you're really like, Sam, I would love to see you and Father Stephen's face as you talk. I've only been listening on the podcast. We'll search on YouTube. So just uh, a little bit of house cleaning on that. And of course, Father Stephen DeYoung, I'm sure most of you already know, he is the host of the Lord of Spirits podcast, uh, the author of many books, such as The Religion of the Apostles and God is a Man of War. And um, Father Stephen, you also just told, and I should say, you are the priest of a church whose name I am forgetting in Lafayette, Louisiana. Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church. Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church, Lafayette, Louisiana. And you are, you just told me you're recording a new book. Uh, do you want to mention what that is to get anyone excited? Yeah. So sometime late spring, early summer, <laughs> once the printing is complete, uh, the next book I've got coming out is called Apocrypha. And it's an introduction to extra biblical literature. So it's sort of introductions to there's an old testament section with things like the book of enoch and uh the testament of the 12 patriarchs and then a new testament section with things like the shepherd of hermas the acts of paul and thecla uh, some of those texts um and so in addition to serving as an introduction to those texts uh it's also frankly kind of a companion volume to religion of the apostles so for the the needs more citations crowd this is where I show some of my work <laughs> um, yeah. going through the text and uh, where uh, some of those things are coming from or where you can see evidence of the existence of certain ideas uh, in that literature that sort of surrounds the scriptures. Mm -hmm. That's, that's very interesting. I'll be excited to check that out. Um, I've, done a fair amount of digging into some of those early Christian apocryphal works. Uh, I, on my uh, Church Father series, I've dug through some of those, but I didn't go through Shepherd of Hermas or like the Acts of Thecla or the Ascension of Isaiah. Some of those things are pretty wild. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> I, I still don't know entirely what to make of the Shepherd of Hermas. And it seems like that one was really kind of close to being included in the canon. Like the the copies of the Bible in at like you know the uh, monastery in Sinai had Shepherd of Hermas in it, and it seems like just barely didn't make it into the canon. Yeah, the the Muratorian canon actually has kind of gives kind of an argument as to why it's not in the canon but should be read right. Why it's in this sort of middle category that existed in the East, um, because. <laughs> It actually identifies who wrote it. So it's uh, it, the Muratorian canon says, well, it's a book of prophecy and the prophets are closed, like the Old Testament. And it was written after the apostles, which means does it fit New Testament? And he says it was written recently uh, by the brother of Pope Pius. So... The Hermas of the Shepherd of Hermas is said by that ancient source, fairly close to what it was written to be, have been the brother of St. Pius, the, the Bishop of Rome. So when would that date it? Like early second century? Yeah. Yeah, early second century. So, yeah, it's very interesting because it, it shows you the continuation of the phenomenon of prophecy in the early yeah. church in a way that a lot of people don't understand. Uh, <laughs> Pentecostal, like like I've told you, I grew up charismatic. We yeah. were like, yeah, of course, of course, they should be experiencing prophecies. If they aren't, that's a that's a problem. Um, although, man, I never heard any prophecy in church growing up quite like the Shepherd of Hermas. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, it is it is kind of an advanced vision, but but it's it's a text that was very well known, right? And so, part of my my reason for doing this book is that I think this is a piece of within Orthodox circles, a piece of our tradition that's been totally neglected. Mm -hmm. um, so people, you know, are, are the current movement within Orthodox theology for the last 50, 60 years 
has been a neo-patristic movement, which has become sort of hyper-focused on the church fathers. But that's been at the expense of biblical theology. And these texts kind of fall into this weird place where they're not New Testament and not exactly a church, church father. Fathers. Right, yeah. And so people have just sort of left them. <laughs> and so trying to recover that as an important piece is part of what, what doing the book was about. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading The Shepherd of Hermas. I read through it with um, our mutual friend, Bo Branson. And I remember trying to figure out its Christology, because that's always, you know, of course, the first question that I have on my head. And I'm pretty sure there is some passage sort of towards the end. I wouldn't be able to think of it off the top of my head. But it basically calls the Holy Spirit the Son of God. And then it talks about Jesus seemingly as this other person. And it seems to me almost like it was the sort of Christology where Jesus is a human. He then almost gets possessed, except in a good sense, right? Not, a, not like a demon possession, but like a spirit angelic possession, for a period of time and then the spirit kind of leaves him and, and goes back up and the human who the human jesus who went through this experience will be treated well but it's but he wasn't the son of god right and uh i i don't know if you agree with that assessment i i mean that was certainly yeah. one of the christologies that we know about but um I, and i was like whoa <laughs> that that's that's uh, that's just a different category entirely yeah, yeah, it is. It is really common to read it as having an adoptionist Christology like that. Um, that's certainly a possible read. Um, I suggest one of the things I suggest in the book in terms of the Shepherd of Hermas is that it's also possible, so that language is not totally dissimilar uh, to language that's used by Saint John in his Gospel in terms of uh, St. John, the forerunner, St. John the Baptist sort of recognizes Jesus as the Messiah based on seeing the Holy Spirit descend upon him at his baptism and rest upon him. Mm -hmm. And so that language is used in St. John's gospel, that kind of language at least. So I can't, I'm not saying you can rule out the adoptionist Christology interpretation, <laughs> right? But I think it's also possible to interpret that same language in another way. Uh, uh, what what would be that other way? Because part of me is like, well, then why not go the same with the Gospel of John? I actually feel like right. sometimes a a heavy emphasis on spiritual possession in the Gospel of John actually could make a lot of sense of the Gospel of John. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I've talked to a scholar, Trolls Engberg Peterson is sort of, the main guy on that uh, camp. I think you can. I think, um, I think it's kind of difficult, not impossible. For example, um, the, the problem gets into then what you think the relationship is between the logos and the Holy spirit. Right. Right. Um, because usually the folks who try to get an adoptionist Christology out of St. John's gospel, or at least the, the, the more quote unquote traditional way to do it, meaning going back to the second, third century, if you look at someone like Serenthus, right, is mm. you have the logos come and sort of possess or attach itself to or connect with the man Jesus, right, in, in that approach. Um, rather than the Holy Spirit. So to me, to make that work with St. John's Gospel as a whole, you'd either have to take the route that some biblical scholars do and chop up the Gospel of St. John a little bit and argue that there are pieces added at different times, or try to connect the Logos and the Holy Spirit as being... One and the same. Yeah, right, and yeah. that's exactly right. what, what Trolls Engberg okay. Peterson does, is he, he uses a very stoic metaphysic. One of his main shticks is like, hey, guys, don't Platonize the Gospel of John, stoicize the Gospel of John. And that in stoicism, pneuma, spirit, and breath, and logos are sort of like two aspects of a similar thing, right? 
I'm talking to you and you hear my words and that has intellectual content, but I'm also breathing my words, right? So it's sort of like there's this forced material breath coming out of me, Numa, and that has an intellectual component in the words and they're sort of like two sides of the same coin. So <clears throat> for what Trolls argues is that the, the word became flesh is the same thing as the Holy Spirit descending upon and remaining on Jesus. And he says, well, you know, the word became flesh, just go a couple verses later and you have the spirit descending on Jesus and John bearing witness to that. And so why not say those two things are the same event? Yeah, I'm, I'm on the side. The reason I wouldn't go with that is I tend to neither Platonize nor Stoicize the Gospel of John, but Judaize <laughs> the Gospel of St. John. Um, <laughs> so... Um, and this is this is part of what was in my dissertation with the Johannine literature is arguing that it's actually deeply Jewish, and so for me, the way the logos is talked about in Saint John is more uh, resonant with Memra, right? The the Debar Yahweh, right? In in the Old Testament and. The spirit is more resonant with the spirit of God. So I would have more difficulty connecting those just because they seem to be sort of different traditional concepts within most Jewish paradigms that I think produced St. John's gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that yeah. uh, <laughs> shepherd of Hermas, if, if, if you, yeah. if you, if you're feeling bored one night, you won't be bored. You might be confused, but uh, give it a read. And another thing that's interesting is it's very angelically mediated in terms of yes. visions and prophecies, right? He gets visited by all sorts of angels and multiple visitations, seemingly. And that's not something that I often hear from modern charismatic circles in terms of how prophecy works. Um, and so that, that, you know, and you can see that in the New Testament some, right? Like, you know, the beginning of Revelation, John says, you know, uh, he basically, Jesus sent his angel to give John the revelation. And you hear about this angelic guide a little bit, but it's not, the angelic guide isn't super prominent. Um, but in the Shepherd of Hermas, the, the angels are super prominent in the whole um, description experience. Yeah, it's very, it's very close to how Daniel works, right? He has these various angelic guides and the various visions who are kind of explaining things to him sort of as they go. Mm-hmm. And he asks them questions, and sometimes they can and cannot answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so anyway, we I think uh, veneration was one of the topics that we were going to start with, and exactly what's going on with veneration. I think that that will lead in a bunch of different directions. I'll give a short promo that I had. Um, I gave a speech at a conference, a Unitarian conference, about... Um, whether or not Jesus was worshipped in the full kind of capital W sense of the word. Um, and uh, Father Stephen was kind enough to listen and send me some, some comments and constructive feedback on that. And as I already told you, you were very influential in my thinking on the topic, although maybe, uh, like I said, I don't want to give you too strong of a compliment on that, but why I would then take your work and then go present it at a Unitarian conference. But, um, but I think that you could tell that, that some, of, some of the ideas were, were in there from you. Um, and so, but part of that was me kind of explaining a worship veneration distinction and then trying to use that between Jesus and God. And that might be the step that an, uh, that an Orthodox person might not appreciate or might not fully appreciate. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so that, at least one a nuance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm here. So anyway, I'll, I'll include the link to that. I, I have, I'll, I'll repost that video on my channel at some point. Um, you can find on the Unitarian Christian Alliance webpage now um, if anyone's interested in that. I haven't posted on my channel for a couple of overlapping intersecting reasons that I won't get into yet. But um, in any case, uh, so how, how would you want to, to nuance that? And how, how, how would you want to kind of delineate uh, veneration and worship? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and this is, this is something we talked about early on on Lord of Spirits 
is I think part of the, the difficulty that a lot of our Protestant friends, um, of whom you are one. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, sometimes the Protestants don't want to seem to have anything to do with me. So I'm, well, okay. I, I'm not sure if I count as a Protestant or not. I'm a Protestant. Who you of ask, Protestants. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, let me say this, right? So if, if you're going by, uh, here, here is the set of, of beliefs that you have to have to be a Protestant, right? I can see why they would say that to you. But your approach to things is very much the Protestant approach to things, even though you get different results than they would like you to get. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's, um, so, um, but I think one of the reasons why, why that distinction is difficult is that a lot of what gets called worship in Protestant settings falls into our category of veneration. Mm -hmm. So I sort of don't blame a Protestant who just wanders into an Orthodox church. And they say, well, wait a minute, you just sang a hymn about this saint, <laughs> right? right? Saying like how great they were, <laughs> right? And uh, you just, in that prayer, ask that saint to pray to Christ for you. Um, and they look at that and go, well, clearly you're worshiping that saint because when they go to church, they pray to Christ, right? <laughs> and, they, and they, um, or pray to God in Jesus name, right? Or, and, and they sing hymns about Christ and what he's done, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. so they say, well, you're doing the same thing I do in worship, but you're doing it directed toward the saint, right? Right, um, right. Whereas for us, this worship the central act of worship is sacrifice and for us that's um primarily the eucharist which you talked about in your talk right um and then also secondarily for us obviously less so for most protestants uh the offering of incense mm -hmm. um so sacrifice for us is the that central that central act of worship and so for us, um, that gets restricted to God, but veneration, singing a hymn, right? Uh, venerating an icon, showing respect to an icon, venerating the scriptures, right? The actual physical book. Um, those kind of things are in a different category. And fall into the general category of, of the honor that is due to the person thing, right? As holy person, as holy thing. Uh, so we sort of, in, in a sense, as an Orthodox Christian, we venerate everything. <laughs> in the sense that we, we, we attempt at least to give everything the respect it's due. Um, and not that it's due... So, for example, with a human, uh, that veneration would extend to this human is made in the image of God. So even if they're not living up to that, right, even if based on their behavior, they might not be due our respect. The image of God in them is due our respect. Um, and that is because uh, we have the idea that the, the honor and respect that you pay passes on to the prototype. Um, and while that's fancy language, it's basically how the parable of the sheep and the goats works in St. Matthew's gospel, right? Whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me, whatever you didn't do, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't do to me. That's just a way and in interesting theological yeah. language to explain that connection. Right. I'd never heard that passage used that way. Yeah. That, that makes a certain amount of sense, but yet you, you, there's still a hierarchy of veneration, right? You don't go saying right. your majesty to everybody. You would right. say <laughs> your, your majesty to the King. And I'm sure there are certain things that you do to a priest that you wouldn't do to a, not a priest, um, certain right. things or, that a bishop. you do, or yeah. bishops, right. Et cetera. Yeah. So there, there are, Categories of uh, and hierarchies of who you can do what to and when and why. Right. It's not and, just and, it's not just a veneration free for all. Right. Right. <laughs> and again, that's based on the office. 
right? So it, your your bishop may be, you know, mine is not, for the record. But <laughs> your bishop might be sinful, wicked, embezzling, whatever, <laughs> right? But you still honor and respect them as the bishop, right? And the king may be, right? You, you might be like St. Paul living under Caligula as the emperor, <laughs> right? But you still give due respect to the authority based on the authority that God has, has, uh, has given them. Right. And obviously, for example, we venerate the scriptures in a way that we don't venerate Moby Dick. Right. Like, right. <laughs> <it's> not, <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there is a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy with it. Well, it would be weird to venerate a whale, but um... yeah, <laughs> the whale or the book. Yeah. Or the book. Um, yeah. There is uh, a there is a website. I don't know if it's still up, but back in the day when the Bible code got really popular, there was a guy who did a Moby Dick codes website <laughs> where he had all these revelations he found in, in Moby Dick, including one page where he found there are no codes in the Bible. There are codes in Moby Dick. Right. To prove <laughs> this point. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's this, this hierarchy of veneration. Um, but so for us, that idea um, that that statement that the honor given to the uh, the object or the person or the thing goes to the prototype. That statement was not first made in terms of the veneration of icons uh, or in terms of the veneration of anything in particular, even of people and the image of God in people. It was actually first made by Saint Basil the Great in terms of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, so, and he was using that to explain, this was part of the, why Trinitarians don't worship three gods. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Why um, not triolatry? Yeah. Right. And so it's monolatry because the worship and praise that are given to the son and the spirit are passed on to God, the father. Mm -hmm. and this is part of, I mean, he's getting that from, for example, where St. Paul talks about all things being subjected to Christ and then Christ giving them over to right. the Father, right? That this is not, Christ's rule is not a separate rule from that of, right, God the Father. Um, and you find that principle, getting back to, we'll get back to extra-biblical literature. So, you mentioned the ascension of Isaiah, interestingly enough, and the ascension of Isaiah actually is made up of three pieces, uh, one of which is the original Jewish piece, and the other two pieces are Christian pieces that got added later. Uh, and in the last Christian piece that was written sometime in the late first century AD, probably around 90, so you, very really late. that that early though yeah for ascension of isaiah oh. yeah that this piece was added <laughs> that this mm. doctoring of the jewish text happened yeah <laughs> um and uh in that uh sort of reworking of the text um and we know it's christian because of this uh the uh Isaiah, it's presented as this vision that Isaiah has when he ascends into heaven. And he sees these two figures. He sees uh, there's God, who he can't see, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And there's what he calls the beloved one, yeah, which pretty clearly is talking about Christ <laughs> right? in context. Yeah. And, and the angel of the Holy Spirit. Right? right, right. This representation of the Holy Spirit. In the book, I get into why it says the angel of the Holy Spirit. Um, but, and then worship is being offered. And it depicts the worship of the beloved one and the worship of the, the angel of the Holy Spirit being passed on by them to God the Father. You see, I, I, re I remember reading this passage that you're talking about. And I, I would say... It seems that it's not worship, capital W worship, it's bowing, right? I think everyone, all the hosts right. of heaven and Isaiah and his angelic guide, again, another angelic guide, um, bowed down to the beloved one, seemingly the pre-incarnate Jesus. 
right? And it is pre-incarnate because this is Isaiah, right? right? Yeah. And yeah, um, that it is, yeah. <laughs> Right. And, and then the, the, the third piece is the narrative of, you know, Jesus going down and back up again, which is yeah. quite fascinating. And then there's the, the angel of the Holy Spirit. Right. right. And then there's another and then like the next verse is like and then like Jesus and the Holy Spirit turn around and then bow to the sort of unseen, fully described God. Right. Right. And, and it's and, sort of past. <laughs> or, or, but I would even say it seems like you know the pre-incarnate Jesus and the Holy Spirit participate also then in the bowing right. towards God. But, but that's that's different than, for example, when someone bows down before an angel and they say, "Get up, <laughs> right? don't do that." Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So there's a different dynamic. That's the only point I'm making. I'm not sure. saying, that, you know. Q -E -D, yes. the Trinity, right? <laughs> Although it, it does seem to yeah. suggest that the that the pre-incarnate Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in a unique category, right? Right. Um, but there's still a f you, more unique category yet uh, of God the Father, right? Right. Um. So, but but you see that sort of dynamic there, and I think it's that kind of thinking that that Saint Basil is appealing to, um, and so. I think it then becomes very difficult, right? In terms of what you're talking about, very difficult to separate out within even just sticking to the New Testament canon. Um, whether this is, whether any given act, right, is, is sort of worship that's being passed on from Christ to the Father or veneration being passed on from Christ to the father, right? That becomes difficult. Now that said, at least in our Orthodox practice, if you read the prayers of the liturgy, we're offering the Eucharist to the father. Um, but obviously Christ and the Holy Spirit are involved and are again in this different category than we would have a saint. So, and you could correct me, my understanding of what you are arguing, because you kind of wanted to push, you, you didn't want to get into the veneration of saints. Um, <laughs> and I'm assuming that's your personal view as well as the audience, right? You're talking to. We, we can talk about that. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I was ruffling enough feathers by taking yeah. <laughs> somewhat of a realistic stance on the Eucharist. So, you know, I there's only so many feathers I can ruffle in 45 minutes. Right. So... It, but, it, but what it seemed to me like what you were doing was you were you were putting Christ into the category where we would put the saints mm -hmm. and then restricting the other category to God the Father. Right. Yes. That's yeah. what I was arguing. And that Jesus could be at the top of the category of veneration. Um, sort of in the way that a Catholic might say that, like Mary gets hyperdulia. I've heard them say that sort of yeah. thing. Do you do you have that sort of distinction of like Mary gets some sort of extra something in terms of veneration? <laughs> um, I mean, we don't have a theological category the way they do, where it's cat. We would. I don't think we'd say it was qualitatively different than the veneration that's given to other saints. But there is definitely a sort of quantitative. Right. She's at the top of the hierarchy of veneration. Right. Of, of saints. But she's not in a different category. Yeah. That would be, that feels a little bit more correct to me too. Um, right. And that, that's, I, that's the difference between us and the Roman Catholics on all kinds of things. Like we're happy to say the Bishop of Rome is the top of the category Bishop. Right. But we would not hold that he is in a different category. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's that's an interesting point. So yeah, in my presentation, that was basically why I was arguing, and I looked at some, you know, like you mentioned, singing a song of praise. You know, there are multiple psalms in the Old Testament Bible that are songs of praise not to God but of humans, such as kings and other uh, important persons. So if you, for a Protestant who thinks that singing a song of praise is what counts as worship. Well, then there are idolatrous worship hymns in the Old Testament to human beings, right? And and as Psalm forty five would perhaps be the most obvious uh, example, which probably in its historical context is King Hezekiah. But then 
in uh, Hebrews, it sort of gets reworked and reapplied to, to Jesus. So maybe a Protestant could wiggle out of that one that way. But there are still other, other ones yet. Um, and then, and, you know, another example I gave is like when David's handing the throne to Solomon, right? All of Israel bows down before God and the king, right? So there's sort of David on his throne in Jerusalem and sort of God invisibly behind the, the throne, right? And all of Israel is bowing down to them simultaneously. And that's not an idolatrous act of worship of King David. It is venerating the king as is perfectly appropriate, right? And right. so, yeah. so as the my, image of God's rule on earth. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah. so my, and then like when I bring that into say Philippians two, where every knee bows, every tongue confesses, right. Uh, Jesus as Lord to the glory of God, the father, yeah. right. That's, that's not a worship of Jesus in the capital W sense. That's like very in that same category as what you did to King David and revelation five, right. Where the lamb gets enthroned and everyone's bowing down and uh, singing, you know, worthy is the lamb that that's in that same category too. Um, so I, I don't know. And I suspect that you maybe don't disagree with that, that point. Right. I mean, for us, I mean, obviously for us, Christ and the Holy spirit are in a different category than the saint category, right? They're in the mm -hmm. God category, <laughs> right? Um we have a monarchical trinity, right? So, um, yeah, but, I mean, the, the, the dynamic there is certainly, um, yes, that, that um, again, like St. Basil said, the, the, that what's given to Christ is everything that Christ receives is, is uh, from right. the Father and, and given to the Father, right? Yeah. But that also brings up the point that you can venerate God, right? It's not like yes. you oh, yeah, don't yeah, venerate yeah. God. <laughs> yes. so, some yeah. people misunderstand the distinction that way, right? We worship God and we venerate saints. So, so then you can't venerate God because he needs something else. No, you, you can venerate God. And so venerating his Messiah is a way of venerating him, right? Bowing your knee and confessing Christ Jesus as Lord it is to the glory of God the Father, right? Even though it's not not worship per se. Right, right, yeah. I mean, we do, I mean, Orthodox Christians sing hymns all the time. Yeah. About God. So, right? Some even to God, <laughs> yeah. We don't just only do the Eucharist and then sing about saints, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, there's, there's an overlap there. So worship includes veneration. Right, but veneration does not imply worship. I guess yeah, would be, yeah, right. Yeah, the, that that makes sense. Yeah, right. The way the way to say that, and so, so to me, yeah. So to me, I I could absorb the point you were making because I would say, well, yes, there isn't sort of worship given to God the Father, and then also worship separately given to Christ, and then also worship separately given to the Holy Spirit. That's the whole point St. Basil the Great is making, right? That that Trinitarians are still monolatrous, right? Because, right. And and with God yeah. the Father being the mono all the the the, the single worshiped one. Right? right, because both Son and Holy Spirit in a monarchical Trinitarianism are um, types and not the prototype. Right, right. That 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 you know, um, yeah. That Christ is the express image of the Father. Right, He is the right. perfect right image of but, the Father. But the Father is the image of no one. He is the unimaged. Right. Or, yeah. Right. Right. The, right. Yeah. And this is yeah. The and, untyped prototype. <laughs> yeah. And this, yeah, people people who watch your channel, you've had enough people on, like Doc Branson, talking about the monarchical trinity, that we don't need to go into all that. Mm. Um, <laughs> so people kind of know what that's about. Yeah. So, um, yeah, again, the, the difference is a very, for, a, for on this point, it would be a very nuanced one in that we would say, well, I think you would want to limit what's done with Christ and I assume by extension, the Holy Spirit uh, 
although I don't know exactly. What I, well, I, I would say the Holy Spirit isn't in the category of things that could be venerated or worshipped. Okay. It would be a power extension of God the Father. Okay, that's what I was wondering. I didn't yes. know. Yes, and so yeah. it's not it's not that the Holy Spirit is a separate being down in the veneration category, but it would be like worshiping God's right hand or something like that. It's like that would just be worshiping God, right? right? Okay. Um, so setting that, that aside, sense. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we would say that you can worship Christ or the Holy Spirit and that worship is passed on to the Father, whereas your view obviously would sort of exclude worship being directed to Christ, yes. even with the idea of it being passed on. Right. It would just be veneration, maybe a kind of hyper-veneration, right? But, yeah. Mm -hmm. But still in the, in the veneration category. Right. Yes. And, and then the Holy Spirit is not in the category of things that could be venerated or right, worshipped. Right, right. That's a whole other right. thing. Yeah. <laughs> it, would be, it would be like trying to worship God's love or something like that. It's like, yeah. well, how would, how would you worship God's love, right? That, right. That's, that's a category mistake. Um, yeah. 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 So for that, that was about, I don't know if I want to go down that road of... <laughs> The well, essence energies so, distinction and stuff. <laughs> right. Well, actually, you know, I, I kind of like the essence energies distinction. Okay. <laughs> um, um, I, I certainly feel like, can discuss it. <laughs> sure, but I, I'll, I'll ask you. So the like, even in the Nicene Creed, right? Um, it says the whole. Or, well, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. This yeah. is one of the parts from the Constantinople part. Is that um, the Holy Spirit together with the Father and Son is um, glorified and worshipped? Or worshipped and glorified, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but although not homoousius, notice that noticeably, the the Holy Spirit gets um, spared homoousius language. I think because <laughs> there was still some Binitarians at uh, Constantinople that weren't ready to go that full nine yards, but um, but clearly Gregory of Nazianzus did but so I, yeah. it doesn't yeah. preclude homoousius by that that is not well, mentioned that's an overread term though too what do you right? mean like in, in that i mean calcedon says that christ is according to his divine nature homoousios with the father and the spirit and according to his human nature homoousios with us mm -hmm. and so that parallel precludes if people understand it, some of that overreading of <laughs> what that means. It definitely means uh, you can't get modalism out of it unless you think you and I are modes of appearance of the same person. Um, right. <laughs> which, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, and I think that together word, together is worshipped and glorified. Uh, the together is underestimated in that I think that together word is there to imply what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Not separately. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Not is also worshiped and glorified, but is part of the worship of, of the father and the son. Again, uniting that worship together. Mm -hmm. And this is where I, I would ask, I don't see any biblical support or examples of worship of the Holy Spirit. Um, well, and, and that's, so again, to have a biblical example of the worship of the Holy Spirit, that would imply that you're worshiping him separately. Mm -hmm. Right. That we could isolate this place. Or, this well, it, yeah. like I would say Ascension of Isaiah has an example. Right. Well, where, yeah. like <laughs> we talked about where you get the angel of the Holy Spirit and everyone yeah. bows down to the pre-incarnate Christ and the the, uh, the Holy Spirit angel. Right. So that, that I would say there you can see it, but I don't see anything comparable or similar to that. That's still a together. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's still together. But I'm saying even it's in that together of sort of God. sense, I don't see any example of that. Yeah. So part of that, I think, is because of the role of the Holy Spirit 
and this this actually touches on why I think it mentions the angel of the Holy Spirit, because sort of by definition, you can't see the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is not a bird, right? That's <laughs> um, and and so. I think angel of the Holy spirit is there to try to give some kind of visual representation of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Holy spirit's function, uh, his, in the economy of our salvation, right. As he is not to reveal himself to us, but to reveal Christ to us who reveals the father to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, for things, there are a few, there, there's a handful of prayers directed to the Holy Spirit, like in Orthodox worship. And I mean a handful. I mean, you can count them on your, on one hand. Uh, and they're at particular times. One of them's in, in the prayers we say at Pentecost, obviously enough, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. There, sense. there are three large prayers we have. Um, so we don't kneel during the 50 days following Pascha. Um, and then on Pentecost, we have what are called the kneeling prayers where we kneel for a long time, especially when you're an old man like me. Um, and there are three long prayers. The first is directed to the father. The second is directed to Christ. The third is directed to the Holy spirit. But again, it's not independently because there there's this continuous, right? When we're talking, when we're praying to God, the father, it's thou and thine only begotten son and thy Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. And when we're we're praying to Christ, it's Thou and Thine unoriginate Father and <laughs> thine, thine All Holy Life Giving Spirit, right? Um, so it's always again uh, brought together. But so any kind of direct worship or even revelation of the Spirit per se would be kind of going against that role. I think the closest thing you could point to is actually uh, things, for example, in the Old Testament that are directed toward the earthly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Because I understand, you know, the the theophanic glory cloud, right? The, 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 the cloud of the presence of God to be a manifestation of the spirit. Interesting. And obviously that worship or veneration right, all of the above that's directed toward the earthly sanctuary is ultimately going to God the Father. Um, but that would, I think, probably be the best example um, of that kind of pass-through involving, involving the Spirit. Once you get to the New Testament and you have the incarnation of Christ you have this direct revelation of the express image of God, the father. And so that you have Christ as the new temple in St. John's gospel, right? The place where God dwells among his people. And so that kind of thing again, becomes sort of unnecessary and, and counterproductive. Right. And, and in Christ's prayer at the end of St. John's gospel, He's sending the Holy Spirit, who, among other things, will uh, reveal him to them, <laughs> right, and to, yeah. and to those going forward. Yeah. Um, so one. Uh, so I'll bring I'll bring the the uh, essence energy distinction back up because okay. when I have heard um, Orthodox people talk about the essence energy distinction, to the extent that I understand it. The, it's sort of like the essence is something like the transcendent aspect of God, which is in some ways sort of unknowable. And the energies are the sort of um, actions that are manifestations of God's work sort of in creation. But it is not as if the energies are a fourth hypostasis in the Godhead, um, but nor are they created but it is sort of get the visible manifestations of God at work. And I, when I heard that, I'm like, man, that is almost identical to how I describe the Holy Spirit. Is, and so I, my question back to you is, is what is the, I'm like, I'm like, yes, not a distinct hypothesis, right? 
but it's sort of like God's activity in the world. You can see the results of the activity, but you can't see the activity itself, right? The spirit moves and you can see wind rustling. You can see leaves rustling on a tree, but you can't see the wind that rustles the leaves sort of thing, right? And 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 wind, of course, in Greek is the same word as spirit. So uh, to me, it, I, I when I heard that, I was like, that's actually giving me some helpful vocabulary to talk about how I uh, have pictured the Holy Spirit. And so I'm. my question to you is, so what's the difference between the energies and the Holy Spirit? And did I get that essence energy distinction wrong in the first place? <laughs> well, there's, there's a nuance that was missing there. And this isn't your fault. <laughs> because most of the times I he hear Orthodox folks try to explain this, they miss this too. And I've probably been guilty of not making this point as clearly as I should too. So <laughs> it's not a blameworthy thing <laughs> that, that you didn't have this. And um, what credit where credit is due, what, what sort of turned me on to this was uh, David Bradshaw's Aristotle East and West, um, which took me back to Aristotle's metaphysics and to the category of energia right in the first place <laughs> right. and so for for aristotle in the metaphysics you have uh dynamis and you have energia those are the two he has everything in these pairs right um and so uh, a nature right has a collection of uh, uh, binameon, right, of powers, right, and uh, but at any given point, and this is now bringing in Christianity, right, created natures are only actualizing some of those powers at any given point, right, no created entity is doing everything it could do all at once, right, um. Mm -hmm. Except then, maybe that street performer who's playing the guitar and might yeah. also have a drum and a yeah, cymbal. Yeah, the one-man band. Yeah, yeah. You know, the one-man band <laughs> and a kazoo. He's maybe pretty close, but yeah, other than yeah. that. Yeah. But even he's not sleeping, right, <laughs> while, he, while he does that. Um, so, but, um, so, of course, we're, when we're talking about God, right, God, God is doing all of those things eternally, right? This is the... The God is sort of pure act idea, right? Um, so a dynamis, the examples that Aristotle uses in the metaphysics are, for example, with a human person, right? You can sleep. At any given time, you could go to sleep. It doesn't feel like that sometimes late at night, but at, you know, <laughs> hypothetically, you could go to sleep. Um, at any given point, you could start dancing. You have the power to do that, right? Um, and then energia on the other side is not just dancing or sleeping, right? It's not the just the activity itself, but it is you dancing or you sleeping. Mm -hmm. right? So the agent is included in the activity. Mm-hmm. And so this is the really important part for what St. Gregory Palamas, who we just commemorated this past Sunday uh, in the Orthodox Church, um, is getting at with the essence energies distinction. Because ultimately what St. Gregory Palamas introduces this sort of arcane distinction to do is to try to explain why uh, your average illiterate monk in his day through a life of prayer and Christian discipline and repentance and following Christ could come to truly know God in a way that a scholar maybe couldn't. Um, and so he makes this distinction that when, for example, the love of God, which is one of the divine energies, God is continually and eternally loving his creation. Uh, 
And so this is one of the divine energies. But it's not just the love of God, but it is God loving. And so when you or I go and we show love to our neighbor and uh, we go and we do some kindness, we show compassion and act in love, we're cooperating with that divine energy. We're operating with it. God is loving that person through us. And so in that, we encounter God. And that is really and truly God. <laughs> right, who who is mm -hmm. there, who we encounter in that. And then that encounter is transformative of us. Um, and so for us, we would make a distinction, right? That we, we would say that one of the things that unites the Holy Trinity is that they have one energy, they have one activity. So the love of God the Father and the love of Christ are not like two separate. <laughs> right thing mm -hmm. right or the love of god the love of the holy spirit right that this is they act together um and so this then is is what we would hold stands behind like what saint john says in first john about love and god being love <laughs> right and uh the one who does not love doesn't know god because god is love mm -hmm. Right, because it's so it's it's in that act. So that's that's the thrust of what we're getting at, and and that's the practical side of it. Um, and love is just one example, of course, right? Like justice or righteousness is another one. Um, but that kind of thing also then don't want to veer too much of this topic. But that 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 gives you a very different reading, for example, of what's going on with righteousness in Saint Paul if that's how you understand righteousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? It's allowing God to act through you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that, that transforms you, mm -hmm. which kind of it, very at odds with the sort of more forensic kind of understanding of that. Um, right. Right. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to, to me that, and then that would be the distinction, right. Is, is that um, between the energies and a per our view of the person of the Holy Spirit, right? Is that the energies is a means of sort of encountering God. God in his essence, right? As he is in and of himself is something we can never know. And mm -hmm. this, this isn't, by the way, also, this isn't just a distinction in God. Now there are differences with God. Like we said, he's actualizing everything eternally and we're not we're doing one thing at a time maybe maybe a couple if we multitask um but pretty much everything <laughs> but especially you and i have essence and energies too right i don't encounter you in your essence <laughs> right? i don't know the essence of sam who um, does yeah yeah even your <laughs> wife doesn't know god does but that's about it yeah. right? yeah. <laughs> that's, um you know um but I encounter you in action, right? And that's a real encounter with you. It's not that you're sort of just this false front and I can't ever know you, but I know you in action. I don't know, right, your essence. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so to me, yeah, again, like the, this sounds very similar to how I would talk about the Holy Spirit where you know, we become indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in this process of sanctifying us, right? But this is an incomplete process, right? There's still a mix of, of sinful Sam and Holy Spirit in Sam that comes out as my actions. And it is the goal to have sinful Sam be a lower and lower percentage of, of the, the actions, right? And to conform my will to God's will. And that's how the Holy Spirit is working in me, right? So when my will is in a line with God's will and I do something, it's both Sam doing it and God doing it in and through Sam, right? But right. I I would right. communicate that as, as the, as I would talk about that as the Holy Spirit at work in Sam doing that. And yeah. so uh, to me, it seems like I have a trouble. I have the trouble seeing the distinction between God's energy uh, and and the Holy Spirit acting in a person. Right. Well, and, and 
I wouldn't say those are two different things, right? Because I'm right. for me, the Holy Spirit acting is God acting, right? <laughs> right, right. Yes. And, and, I, I and, agree with you about that part, right? <laughs> right. Um uh so yeah, so and that's yeah, this is what's going on. This is how, for example, Saint John Cashin understood what Saint Paul says. You know, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is working in you to mm -hmm. will and to do. Yeah. Right. According to, to his good pleasure, that, that it's about that cooperation. And so this is why at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, the importance of Christ having both a divine and human will, the idea being that those are in perfect alignment, right? Unlike right. my will and... <laughs> and, and the will of God, right? Right. Um, and and yeah, and so it's a question of yes, through oh, this is part of theosis is that I don't lose, we don't lose our humanity. We aren't sort of absorbed into. Right? Nor do we even lose uh, our own will. Right. It's just that our will becomes so aligned with God that when we will to do something we're willing God's will and that action comes through us and it's God's action. Right. Right. And, and this is a point that um, St. Maximus, the confessor made that he got involved in a dispute about whether in the eschaton, right. In the age to come, we'll have free will. And so his, his opponent was saying, well, no, we won't because if we had free will, then we'd be able to fall into sin again. Mm -hmm. And St. Maximus says, no, we'll never fall into sin again because we'll be truly free. Right. Right. And, <laughs> and, and the highest form of freedom is being having a will that does the right thing. Right. Because our sinful will traps us in sin and is limited and, and has all sorts of negative repercussions. And we can't always even imagine or even a will to do the right thing. But when, but when our will is perfected, it's at its most free, not its least free. Right. Right. Because, yeah. The, the will, this is, again, sort of the understanding of the natural will coming out of Aristotle's physics. We think of the will as a decision-making making faculty where I get to choose between different things. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the natural will is sort of what propels us in the direction of the perfection of our nature. So Aristotle would talk about an acorn having a will. <laughs> right, right. And, and that's sort of the inner force that grows it into the oak tree mm -hmm. yeah. that is the perfection yeah. of its nature and so saint maximus says that with the expulsion from paradise there's this second movement of the will that he calls the gnomic will that comes in which is based on us no longer being able to easily perceive the good and perceive the perfection of our nature and so we have to make decisions. That's a defect. That's a bug, not a feature, right? <laughs> Having to choose. <laughs> right? And that's because... where that, that's where I might deviate from Maximus. I, yeah. For the most part, I actually like Maximus on the well. I've had a conversation with Jordan Daniel Wood recently, who's sort of a Maximus scholar. Shout out to Jordan. He, he has a pretty great book on Maximus. And to me, it seems like one could say that the deliberation part where I'm like, all right, I've got choices. I need to think, man, should I get, should I get the Chevy Tahoe or the Ford Explorer as my <laughs> next car, right? Oh boy, let me make a spreadsheet and compare specs and prices and options and stuff like that, right? Uh, I'm, it's sort of, I'm operating with limited knowledge and limited intelligence, right? But if I were to become more perfect than I am, and have, well, if not omniscience, right? Something more like, I, well, I shall know it as I'm fully known, right? Yeah. That, that my deliberation would just be accurate, right? It would be perfectly accurate as opposed to, man, I'm limited by my intelligence. I'm limited by I didn't get a great sleep last night. I'm limited by the fact that these car manufacturers are trying to deceive me for their own purposes, right? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it seems to me like one could imagine a perfection of the deliberative faculty as opposed to just an elimination of the deliberative faculty. Right. Well, so that's not, yeah. So I need to make a further distinction, I think, in okay. terms of what St. Maximus is saying. Because St. Maximus does have the idea, contra Platonism, <laughs> right, that uh, multiplicity is not necessarily bad. Evil. 
or a yeah. deficiency. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. yeah. <laughs> That's, um, th there could be multiple good options. And when you're talking about which which truck to buy, right? Like you're you're sort of within that territory. When you're in the territory of like moral action, right? What is the right thing for me to do? morally mm -hmm. in this situation what is the right way for me to treat this person what, what is the right word for me to say at this moment i think that's a different kind of deliberation mm -hmm. right where that's a kind of deliberation that's more clearly a bug right I, I i don't know what the right thing to do is maybe there isn't any clear right thing because of the fallen world we live in right <laughs> like there is no just universally good option and that that's kind of, I think, more what St. Maximus is aiming at with this second movement of the gnomic will. And that's why he said Christ didn't have one of those. Right. Not that, that Christ was like unable to choose, you know, which piece of fish, right, to eat <laughs> right? When, he, when he sat down. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, but that he didn't need to sort of morally deliberate. Yeah. And, and my question is, is how could such a person be tempted? Right. I, well, I don't, I don't, the way we commonly use the word tempt, I don't think he could. I, so you I don't think, think Christ could be tempted, but wasn't he tempted in all things such as we are yet without sin? And right. certainly and, there's that and, incident in the desert with Satan that certainly yeah. seems like a temptation. Tempted was a good translation of that at one point. But the way we think about temptation now is exactly that, is entertaining the idea of sin and then rejecting it. Mm -hmm. Right. That's how that's how we understand temptation. The the words that are used there are more like tested. Mm -hmm. Well, tempted and tested is the same word, I believe. Right, right. 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 Like, yeah. But but in terms of our common use. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so tested does not imply like entertaining the idea of sin and then rejecting it. <laughs> right. Um you know, uh, so it's more like, you know, Abraham is told to go sacrifice Isaac. Right. And he wonders, should I, I want to keep my son alive. Maybe I won't right, follow that right. command. Yeah. But this is a, this is a testing, right? Or when St. Paul talks about the testing of your faith, right? Um, so I understand those passages as talking about Christ being tested right, in all manners, but he passes the test, right, Get, uh, all the way, all the way through. For example, he goes into the wilderness and is tested, right, by, by Satan. I think this is pretty clearly paralleling. It's 40 days instead of 40 years, but with the wilderness wanderings, mm -hmm. right, yeah. in the Torah, yeah. where Israel is tested and over and over again fails. Mm -hmm. No, I would agree with that. The test, right? And whereas Christ passes the test, like with flying colors, right? Um, but but I I'm going to resist and push back on the idea that Jesus doesn't get tempted in the full sense of the word, in terms of being able to entertain the idea of having done the wrong thing. Because for me, in my Christology, that's very important that Jesus would be of the same kind and his experience would be of the same kind that we are, right? Because I, my basically, uh, you know, if Athanasius is God became man so that man might become God, my Christology would be Jesus became God so that we might become God, right? Um, and this, when Jesus is out there in the desert and, and Satan is saying, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this earth. Like, I really do think that Jesus feels the tug of that idea, he also feels the tug of hunger. He, um, at, well, I'm not sure how tempted he was to to uh, jump off the the um, uh, temple and have the angels catch him. I always felt like that was not what not the not the most tempting temptation of the three temptations. Clearly, that one is uh, the 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 least tempting. But that Jesus is experiencing the the tug. I guess you could say the de deliberation and even able to you know entertain the thought perhaps of making the wrong choice. And, you know, and, and like when we're tempted, it's often not just like a cognitive thing where it's like, oh, I could choose the Ford Explorer instead of the Chevy Tahoe, even though that would be a mistake. It's more like our passions, right? We feel, we feel a really strong um, emotional pull on us to, to go in the wrong direction. 
And for me, it's like very important that Jesus is in that situation, feeling all those same feelings and thoughts that we are, but overcomes it. And like that step of overcoming each time is part of Jesus's own theosis that opens up theosis to us by grace that he did by will, I would say. Right, right. And that's, yeah, and this is where we're on opposite ends, right? Because mm -hmm. for me, Christ is a divine person who takes upon himself human nature, right? Right. But couldn't you and, also say that the, the, the human nature could be tempted? Well, a human nature is not a thing. Mm -hmm. Right. He doesn't what do you take mean upon by himself that? a human person, right? <laughs> he takes upon himself human nature, which means he adds to the divine person he already is another set of potentialities and powers that is human. Mm -hmm. And so we would understand that he voluntarily accepts what we would call the blameless passions. There's blameless passions and blameworthy passions, right? So thirst, hunger, getting tired. These are bl blameless passions in and of themselves. Now, if overindulged, they can become blameworthy. But, or they could be mixed with blameworthy. Right. Yeah. And then there are blameworthy pass passions like lust, pride, right? That are always, right, blameworthy. Mm -hmm. um, they don't sort of admit of a mean, right? Um, and so for us, Christ is free of the blameworthy passions. He voluntarily submits to the blameless ones. So he was voluntarily becoming tired, voluntarily... Uh, subjecting himself to hunger and thirst. Uh, and the place where you really see this, I think, is in St. John's Gospel, where there's this running theme where sort of no one can kill Jesus. They keep trying to kill him. And eventually he just says, no one can take my life from me, right? I, right. I can lay it down and I can take it up again, right? That, that even death, right, is something he's going to do voluntarily, that he has to submit himself to. Right. And so, yeah, so in a sense, we're, we're coming out from opposite directions. For you, Christ is a human person who takes upon himself the divine nature through theosis. For mm -hmm. me, he's a divine person who takes upon himself human nature in the incarnation. Right. And, and my constant worry with that is it makes Jesus less imitatable, right? Uh, and less, I don't know, relatable. I think I think that's sort of the the weakness of going on that side is the the what would Jesus do question sort of uh, loses a little yeah. bit of oomph uh, if um, right. if, if he if he doesn't experience my experience that way. Yeah, for us, this is part of the role of the saints, right? This is why you have Saint Paul saying, "Imitate me as I imitate Christ." Mm -hmm. uh, so with if you look at orthodox icons of the saints you can get line up you know 150 icons of different saints in one sense they all kind of look the same right they're all in the same style and everything mm -hmm. um and in another sense each one is a little different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's deliberate that's a deliberate iconographic representation because the saints show us hundreds of different ways to be like christ in different times and different places, right? Different genders, different, right? Occupations, different ways of life, different roles in the church. Um, but each of them has become Christ-like in, in sort of multiple ways. And this is, this is what gives so much importance to the reading of saints' lives. Uh, the, um, the, uh, taking of a patron saint who you sort of connect with their life, right? And that role. And I, I don't think this is totally foreign to the scriptures because, I mean, we have the whole Old Testament. That's most of the Bible, right? And it's about people other than Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? No, um, no. And, and, and I, I, think, I might affirm that even more solidly than you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's ultimately all about Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. But in an ultimate sense, but right. immediately, right, yeah. we're talking about these other people. Sure, sure. And, and you can jump too quickly to typology. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to get there eventually, right? But you need to spend some time with the actual person right, right who, who we're reading about also. 
And typology uh, will always fall short for the same reason why there's some individual characteristics of a saint that aren't fully Christ-like. Right, right. Um, and so I think it's an extension of that, right? That, that, um, and sainthood of that. Yeah. And, and that is, right? Um, yeah, I would not say that we're, I think, frankly, it's dangerous. Um, and a big red flag goes up for me when I'm hearing anyone talk about theology and they try to psychologize Jesus. Right. What is Jesus thinking at this moment? <laughs> right? Like, what is, how is he, you know, how did, to me, that's, you know, not just because it gets bad. I mean, I think obviously theologically that's wrong based on my view of Christology, but also I think it, it produces a lot of bad results and you get a lot of weird things where people sort of over identify. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's the best way to read the scriptures. It's a, it's, it's the way as moderns, we read almost everything and why and consume media. Well, right. yeah, I mean, pardon me is like uh, uh, over identify it. Well, although I can I can understand what you're saying, where sometimes we project ourselves onto him in a way that's not fair. Right. Where we bring our own contemporary concerns and bring those back in a way that can be misrepresentative. Uh, that would I, I would be fine agreeing with. But I, I mean, I would say I do like to uh, psychologize Jesus. Like, you know, what's going, what is it, what would it be like to be in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Like that, that's something more intense than I've ever experienced. But in the same way, when I'm going through a hardship or, or feeling like something difficult in my life is happening to me, but God is asking me to go through this with, you know, bravery and submission, Right. I can think back to the Garden of Gethsemane and be like, well, Jesus did something even more severe than what I'm being asked to do now. And I can think upon what it was like to be him and find inspiration and guidance in that for what it's like to be me now. Yeah. So. I don't want to go too pop culture with. It. Oh, why not? So. <laughs> To me, this way of reading gets into the difference between DC Comics and Marvel Comics. <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> or at least this is, this is a way, right, to... <laughs> right, a way, a pop culture way at this, I think. Right? So... And this is classically, right? Right now, there's all kinds of... But, but go back into the 1960s, right? Um, the DC Comics characters were all sort of aspirational characters. Right. So Superman is this morally perfect being. Right. He, he always knows the right thing to do. He always does it. Mm -hmm. Right. He's always heroic. <laughs> right. Just, it's a little docetic, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. But but that's how that's how Superman is. Right. Yeah. Like that's just and, and Batman knows everything. Right. And like, you know, um, is the master of every skill. Right. Um and the idea was that the, the reader would look up to this person, right? And, and they're aimed, bad news folks, comics are, are juvenile fiction. They're aimed at, at young people. Um, <laughs> that's, um, but that kids would look up to, right? And, and, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like them in this way, right? And it would inspire them. Um, and Marvel characters that come out in the sixties, Captain America being the big exception because he's from back in the forties, right? Uh, we're very different. So like Spider-Man was super relatable, right? He's this broke kid, right? <laughs> Living yeah. with his aunt, doesn't have any money, unlucky with women, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. So the kids who are reading it can identify. Yeah, like, I know yeah, what man. it's like to be the weird teenager in my high school class who doesn't fit in and wishes that they were better than they were. Yeah. Right. And the X-Men, you know, they all hit puberty and have weird things happen to their bodies and stuff. You know, and kids are like, yeah, I know what that's like, right? Um, and then the inspiration comes from, even though this person has all the same problems I do, they sort of, right, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, push, pack, push past it, right? And... In terms of our, our cultural media, everything is swung way in the Marvel direction, right? So, like, you'll see people criticizing Lord of the Rings because none of the characters are relatable, right, in the books. 
Except for Sam Wise, Gamgee, right? Yeah, I, I feel <laughs> like every, everyone still relates to Sam. <laughs> but even he is like the perfect friend, right? <laughs> like, I have never been that good of a friend to anyone, right? As mm-hmm. he is to Frodo, right? Um, that they're sort of it's sort of written as this sort of aspirational thing. They're these heroic figures who you would aspire to be like, uh, more archetypalized or yeah, something like yeah, that. yeah. Um, and we're very much more in the relatable thing. If we watch something and and there's not a character in there that you you can relate to at all, you you usually turn it off, right? Um, And so to me, um, I think one of the things that makes the Hebrew Bible stand out among ancient texts is that every figure in it is far more relatable than anybody you find anywhere else, right? Like Gilgamesh is not relatable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Kadu is not relatable. They're DC comic characters. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. like David, Samson, Moses, much more relatable, right? Uh, in a way that, that the others are not. Um, it may not be a coincidence that all those Marvel characters were created by Jewish guys. Um, a lot of the DC characters were too. So yeah, um, but um, when it comes to Christ, <laughs> right? Again, and this is based on my Christology, right? Where where I hold him to be a divine person, right? I don't think God is relatable. Right? I don't think that's the aim. Um. Since, since our view of theosis and salvation is that we become by grace what Christ is by nature, um, that he, he represents. So we see in Christ the perfection of human nature, but that perfection of human nature is perfected precisely in being united to God in his person. Mm-hmm. And so... For me, I guess it's it's less than problematic to not be able to get into his head. Right. Um, and for me, I'm like, yeah. well, maybe perhaps the perfect fusion of DC comic and Marvel comic. <laughs> right. He, Captain America. He, he is the archetype, right? Of course, I would say that he's an archetypal character. And of course, I wouldn't say that he has flaws that help make him more relatable or something like that. But I don't know. I feel like reading the Gospels, his character, he just leaps off the page as a, as a personality that is, you know, unique and perfect, but still relatable. And uh, the, a, a character that captures the imagination and sticks with you. And I feel like he's got that perfect combination or balance of DC and Marvel, I would say. So here's a question for you regarding your Christology. Go for it. And this is an honest question. This is not, this is. Go for it. If you've got, back. if you've got gotcha questions, those no, are. No, this is not a gotcha. This is further explanation. All right. Um, I mean, who knows where it'll end up as we talk, but. <laughs> um, so. If I understand correctly, what you're saying is that, well, there's a couple questions related to this. So Christ is sort of the first one to, how would you put it, to fully achieve theosis? First one to fully achieve theosis. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Is there something special then for you about Jesus that allowed him to be that person or could any person who lived in the history of the world before him have done that too? Um, I would say the only person who could have was Adam. And that's because there is something uniquely shared about Adam and Jesus as being unique, direct creations of God. Right. And so for Jesus, it's the virgin birth that sort of puts him outside the normal operations of being a fallen, sinful human. Okay. And that he has this unique Adam-like quality of being directly created by God with innocence and you could say full potential um, that is different. It's not like John the Baptist could have done it or uh, Peter or any of the other people around. There is something extremely unique about Jesus. He's the only begotten son, right? 
And for the record, I still like Only Begotten as a monogonese translation, but we don't need to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but um, uh, but that there is something unique about Jesus that no one else had except in a certain sense, Adam. Okay. So do you go all the way with Augustinian original sin or part of the way? Or- part of the way, I don't know. I, I'll, I'll say I'm open-minded on this. You know, I... I, I, I feel like Calvinist total depravity is a little bit too severe. Um, but, uh, and whether you want, I, I don't know if I'm going to say it's transmitted or I'm certainly not going to give some scientific, you know, it's right. on chromosome 17, <laughs> yeah, right? In this region, you know, something like that. <laughs> but, but I do, you know, I, in general, in some sense, I, I would say I believe in uh, original sin for all humanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that Jesus. Enough. That enough it would be impossible for them to yes right yes but, yeah yeah and um, and jesus then gained to be outside that category of original sin by the virgin birth and i that leaves me a bunch of options to explain in more nitty-gritty detail how that would work but i feel like that's enough for now right <laughs> right so does your view of christ being tempted mean that it would have been possible Uh, This is an old theological argument, whether it was possible for Christ to sin. But so from your perspective, would it have been possible for him to fail in that mission the way Adam did? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's that it brings up the question of God's providence, right? And, and whether it's to me, I'll say it's logically possible, right? That, that Jesus could sin. There's nothing impossible to me to imagine Jesus having failed in a completely abstract sense. But then that brings up the question of what God knew would happen and what God's providence right. in the situation was. And that's a that's its own old yeah. question. But to me, yeah. there's nothing logically impossible about it, if that makes sense. Okay. So then third piece of this for me is, so for you, Jesus achieves it. How does that then directly change things for you and I, where you and I are in a different category than Moses or Abraham. Right. And I would maybe say something like what Jesus achieves by will, we are then able to receive by grace or something like that. And that I would say part of how this works and this, you know, will connect to atonement and stuff like that. But I would say Jesus becomes a life-giving spirit, right? First Corinthians 15. The First Adam, yeah. yeah. And so to me, in some sense, and this is similar to what we're building upon, what we talked about in the essence, energy, Holy Spirit part, is that Jesus, in some sense, becomes so, through his theosis, he almost becomes united with the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to say ontologically, but through participation or something like that, Jesus and the Holy Spirit get kind of blurry together, right? And to me, this is how I'd answer, like, why does Paul call the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God or, you know, the Holy Spirit, right? Why are all of those title, acceptable titles for the same thing? And to me, Jesus, as a spiritual life-giving spirit, as a spiritual body, is in some sense, when the Holy Spirit's in you, that is Christ in you. And that we are becoming now, by the Holy Spirit's sanctification, conformed to the image of Christ from one degree of glory to the next. And that it's that part in us that is able to survive the judgment and will be that we will be completely united with in the resurrection. If, I'm not sure if that fully answers your question. Maybe you have some follow-up questions. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I see what you're getting. So how bound to the chronology would that be? Good question. Yeah. Um, and uh, so could that work backwards, right? Because if right. Jesus became yeah. a life-giving spirit, and I'm saying that happened in 33 AD precisely, um, that how would that work for Moses or Abraham or David or any other Old Testament saint that we could think of? Good question. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I feel like most Christian uh, um, atonements have sort of that weird sort of thing where there can be a four echo, like 
Abraham saw my glory. He, you know, he, he saw my day. He saw my glory. He saw it and was glad, right? There's this sense in which Abraham being before Jesus was also coming after Jesus in this sort of weird asynchrony. Um, and that, of course, also brings up how I translate John 8. But um, I think something like it is such a transformative event that even though it happens at a particular point in time, its chronology can go backwards and forwards. Okay. See, this is this is one of the reasons why, even though we radically disagree on this stuff, why uh, I why I appreciate talking with you, Sam, is that I'm not just saying this to flatter you because you already had me on the show. I don't need to butter you up, but that <laughs> you're willing to admit the places where you're still kind of working it out, <laughs> right? where you're still thinking things <laughs> through. Which, which a lot of people won't, <laughs> you may have mm -hmm. noticed. <laughs> like, a lot of people are just like... Yeah. Well, I, I also feel like part of it is like, I, you know, I grew up in a very Bible-focused church. And, you know, I, I've certainly grown and changed from what I grew up being. And I could list a whole sequence of things that I've changed my mind on. Like, say, the Eucharist being one of those things that I've changed my mind on. But in a lot of ways, I'm still, of course, very similar to what I was raised with, and it still makes a lot of coherent sense to me. And a lot of times I feel like I'm just trying to describe, in some sense, what I knew intuitively. And that that's sort of part of the figuring it out, right? It's part of me is like, man, I think I already know the answer to this, but it's pre-propositional or sub-propositional. How would I have to propositionalize this? Um, if, if that makes any sense. So that, so part of, part of the exploration process is becoming familiar with, I think what I already maybe believe, but just uh, haven't had to explore intellectually yet. Right. Right. And there's, we have a procedural difference too, right. As I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, um, with you at least taking a Protestant approach <laughs> right? and, and me taking an orthodox approach where I was thinking about this recently because I was, I was talking to someone who's the spouse of a, of a parishioner. And um, part of this goes back to in the, in the Protestant Reformation, the discussion about whether the church was rightly the object of faith. Meaning your average medieval peasant could not explain the Holy Trinity to you, right? <laughs> like at all, <laughs> right? Um, Still true. <laughs> and theology <laughs> yeah. would be at a loss, right? <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. they knew, hey, on the Lord's Day, I go to the one church in my village, <laughs> right? And yeah. I receive the Eucharist and I pray and I repent of my sins, right? Like that that's what they understood. And so... The teaching of the Roman Catholic Church at that time was, well, no, the, the average person doesn't need to understand all these things, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. They just need to sort of submit to the authority of the church and say, well, I, I believe what the church teaches, even though I don't yeah. have a fully worked out understanding of that. And the Protestant reformers very much came out against that and said, which is kind of required by sola fide, right? Like you have mm -hmm. to believe something, right? <laughs> like, yeah. And said, no, at least on, and then everybody defines what the basic issues are differently, but at least on some basic issues, no, people need to understand these things. And that had good effects, right? In, in terms of it, it, Protestantism, right? Raised the education levels, raised literacy levels everywhere it went, right? Although I would say there's a weird inverse, you know, there's a chicken... I did that last time too. All right. Sorry. Sorry, uh, okay. internet world about the loud bang. Um, there's a weird chicken and an egg question, I feel like, with education and literacy in the Protestant Reformation, because I feel like part of the Protestant Reformation was spurred by increased literacy. Right. Yeah. So even the idea that we could expect our parishioners to read the Bible for themselves or something, for example, sort of pre requires um, literacy and cheap books. Right. Right. Well, and that's this is part of the point I make a lot now that that to have an idea, there has to be certain material precursors. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if there were not rising literacy rates and there was not a printing press, then no one would come up with the idea like, no, everyone needs to read the Bible for themselves mm -hmm. because 
that would sound ridiculous, right? <laughs> right. It's like because our whole village has one Bible, yeah. right? And and we're lucky that we have that one because it was donated by Prince so and so two hundred years ago. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that would be no one could come up with that idea. So yeah, there 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 is there is a relationship there, but. From the orthodox perspective, right? So how I orient myself and having right grown up in a Protestant community, right, reorient myself over the last 20 years that I've been in, in the Orthodox Church, is that for us, when you come into the Orthodox Church, you're again submitting yourself to, well, okay, I'm gonna believe what the church teaches, even if some of it doesn't make sense to me even if some of it I don't even know about yet, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to submit that the church, this is the church, and therefore it has kept the truth. And so for me, whether I'm doing academic work or pastoral work or whatever, it's always about, I need to dig deeper into the tradition to find the answer, right? And then accept what I find. Again, even if it seems weird <laughs> to me or doesn't make sense yet, and that's sort of, I, th I think that's actually what Fides Quirin's Intellectum meant originally. Uh, we tend to understand that as fake it till you make it, right? Well, just, mm -hmm. just believe it, even though right? <laughs> you don't, you don't, it doesn't make any sense to you. Um, I think it originally meant more faithfulness, that you live the Christian way of life, you, you stay faithful to it, and then continue to strive to understand things more, more deeply. Right. So that's, um, that's another reason why I like talking to you and I'm willing to come on your channel, even though we radically disagree is that there's no debate going on. Um, because for me, that would be kind of pointless in both ways. Um, in the sense that I, as an Orthodox priest, I'm not going to be convinced that the church is wrong, right? I, I would have to cease being who I am. Um, but also my approach in terms of talking to other people about the Orthodox church is not, well, what I need to do is convince you that all of these teachings of the church, each one of them, I have to go through the list and convince you that each one of them is true to try to get you to join. And that would church. get me saved or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's, that's not how it works. So, yeah, with with my parish, you know, you come and you become a part of the parish, you become part of our community, you become part of our shared life together. It's only in that context that any of the teachings of the church make sense anyway. <laughs> right. Um, and and that kind of happens over time. But I, I, I'm not trying to convince <laughs> right. I, I, I'm willing to explain, you know, here's to the best of my understanding what the church has taught on this with me being fallible and limited mm -hmm. yeah. in my understanding of it. And that so that this is something this is very related to a lot of conversation. I was, a lot of conversations I've been having recently. I won't go into too much detail, but I'm having a little bit of friction with my current Trinitarian church at the moment, which uh, you can imagine uh, happens uh, from time to time. And. A lot of it is that, um, uh, like, especially, at, you know, this so like a Trinitarian evangelical Bible oriented sort of person um, will say, you know, Sam, you need to believe in the Trinity or else you're not saved. OK, so that might be something that you agree with. But what they articulate by this is that, Sam, atonement only works if the Trinity is true perhaps because they sometimes struggle to articulate why, but like some of the reasons why would be that in a penal substitutionary model, we need like a perfectly infinite substitute in order for it to be able to transfer to everyone, perhaps. Right. Cur deus homo, right. Yeah. So, so, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, we need, we need some extra ingredient in our crucifixion that is Jesus's divine nature or else it doesn't work. And so therefore, if you didn't believe that in, in the sense of affirming that as propositionally the correct thing, then this penal substitution won't happen to you, right? Because you're not affirming the proposition. So therefore, Sam, we're seriously concerned about the salvation of your soul because you don't believe in the Trinity, because, it, because 
from our perspective, your atonement theory is insufficient, so therefore you're not atoned for. And that jump from your atonement theory is insufficient, therefore you aren't atoned for, is that sort of weird, it's the propositional affirmation that saves you, right? And this is this is this conversation I've been trying to have, and it's a little bit difficult. I'm like, in my perspective, it's sort of like we're getting on an airplane, right? And we need to know a certain amount about how to get on an airplane. You need to know how to get to the right gate. You need to know to bring your boarding pass and your identification and how to get to the airport and how to navigate security, et cetera. You need to know some things to get on an airplane. But getting on an airplane is an act of trust, right? You're trusting the pilot, you're trusting the plane, you're trusting the engineers that did the maintenance on the plane, you're trusting the air traffic controller, et cetera. There's a whole, about, a whole lot of this process that you have no control over, but you have control over how to get on the airplane and doing the act itself. But it's the airplane that gets you to where you need to go, right? And that act of trust was sufficient for you to get from your uh, you know, origin to your destination. And... But you don't understand how the airplane engine works. You don't understand how a jet engine works. You don't understand the laws of physics such that an airplane can stay in the air, right? You don't even understand how to operate the radio to communicate with the, the you know, tower, et cetera. But it's not your understanding that makes the airplane fly. The airplane's going to fly. And you need to do your act of committing and trust to be on the airplane. And so that, that's sort of my, I, it's not a perfect analogy, obviously, but for, for this thing that I keep butting up against, especially, and, you know, like you said, orthodoxy views these things differently, but you know what I'm talking about in terms of pretty propositionally oriented Protestantism that views the affirmation of the proposition as the act of saving you. To me, that's like saying you, the kid needs to understand how the jet engine works in order for the plane to get to him where he needs to go. It's that, it's the, it, the propositions aren't what's doing the trick. We're trying to propositionalize what is doing the trick, I guess. And, and that, I, I don't know if that, that, that whole rambling made any sense, but. No, no, it, it does. It's, but I, so this is, part of a part of how protestantism has shifted since like the actual reformers yeah and there's a couple of shifts um one of them is the understanding of faith as believing certain things right <laughs> believing a, that yeah. yeah yeah that it's a transitive yeah um and so then you get all the debates right about how long is that list? How short is that list? Right. The whole mere Christianity thing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And it's believing these things are true. That's the mode of salvation. And then the other piece I think is the way Protestant ecclesiology has kind of fallen apart. Um, Fair enough. Luther and Calvin had this very strong idea that you can identify, okay, this is a true church. And that doesn't mean, they agree with me about everything, right? But <laughs> again, there's there's certain core that they have. The word is preached, the sacraments are celebrated, and there's some sense of church discipline, mostly moral, mm -hmm. right? It, it Not propositional, because the yeah. the church discipline I run into is purely propositional. Right. No one <laughs> seems to be upset about me about the way I'm living my life. Not saying right. I'm perfect. Well, but... that's that's a product of the first part, right? Where now right. it's if you believe these certain things, your works don't matter, right? <laughs> right. Um, and if you don't, your works don't matter. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But if it has those things, and Calvin even says in the Institutes, it's not enough for one of those to be deformed. It has to be absent, right? Mm -hmm. They have to not preach. They have to not have sacraments. They have to not have any church discipline, right? And then you're allowed to leave that church and go to a different one that is a true church right? That mm -hmm. has those things. Um, but now, and, and I've asked this to Presbyterian pastor friends of mine who go and plant a church in a city. I'm like, well, there's already a Missouri Synod Lutheran church there. Are you saying they're not a true church? Well, no, they're a true church. And <laughs> this other church, well, they're all, yeah, they're also a true church. Luther and Calvin both thought that individual Roman Catholic parishes could be true churches. Um, 
you know, uh, well, then why are you planting another one? Well, we have these doctrinal distinctives. And when you shift ecclesiology that way, then it means, well, being a member of this church as opposed to the one down the block means you have this even longer list of things that you accept. Right. And if you're not on board with those, <laughs> right, then, then you need to be going to the one down the street that more agrees with you. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Where, whereas like my Orthodox parish, I think is probably closer to how they do it in a synagogue, frankly, in that, I mean, I have people, very faithful people who have attended every Sunday for years, but don't join. Don't, don't enter the Orthodox church because there are things they disagree with or the, that, kind of, but they're there. They're some of my mm -hmm. most faithful, most faithful people. Right. right? But they're not taking so communion. They the preaching and they, and, they're not uh, th those people aren't taking communion right 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 they're not they they can't receive the sacraments but they're there they're here they listen they, they the sing key. they pray they kneel yeah. they stand up etc they, they sit and eat food with us and right <laughs> talk with us and they're part of the community in every way except the sacraments mm -hmm. uh, and they're free to do that right uh, if they wanted to receive the sacraments to be received into the church, they would need to say, well, I'm going to be subject to, right, what the church teaches, what the, right, mm -hmm. um, even if I don't understand it, even if, you know, there's things I still have problems with, I'm going to be subject to that. But they're honest and say, I'm not there yet. They may be there at some point in the future. They may never be, right? Um, and that's more how we, how we handle it. So the, the, the doctrinal affirmation that you make is basically just that I'm going to subject my own independent judgment to the judgment of the church. Um, but otherwise you're free to be there, right? <laughs> and be part of the community and, and, and participate. So if you lived here, you would be perfectly welcome to come. If you wanted to receive the Eucharist, you'd have to make that extra step if you wanted to. But if not, you know, you'd be welcome to, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, to do as you see fit. So yeah, it's it's a very different approach, and it and it's we're still. This is another development in the 17th century in Western Europe in the in the Protestant world is the idea of a religion as a system of beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to previously where religions were just sort of the way of life of a people. And I, I'm working very hard to bring, and, and due to the really good people I have in my parish here, to bring sort of us back to that, that we're a community, we live our lives together in this way, and that's what being an Orthodox Christian and a member of this parish in, in Lafayette is about. Um, um, but how do you do yeah. that in so part of part of that problem, part of the awareness of a thing called religion is yeah. pluralism, right? When we have different ways of life interacting and coexisting side by side, or perhaps not even coexisting particularly yeah. well, right? Um, and, and that is sort of the pluralism question that sort of brings into mind, oh, I have religion, you have religion, they're different in these ways in terms of what we believe and what we do, etc., Right. And, you know, the Roman Empire certainly had plenty of problems around how to deal with religious pluralism, and they weren't the first either, you know. Uh, and, but how do you deal with trying to reinstantiate that view of religion as a way of life in a pluralistic society? I have to imagine there's a fair amount of Catholics and Baptists nearby uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana, too. Yes. A lot of Catholics. It's actually 70 percent Roman Catholic down here on paper. Mm -hmm. you know, there's not, I mean, that would be hundreds of thousands of people showing up at mass every week, which we don't have. So, <laughs> that's, um, but yeah, so for, so for us, it, it's a matter of the community itself and viewing the community as what the church is about, right? We're, we're not a group who have all come to the same conclusions about our beliefs. And so we've chosen to gather here and worship together. Mm -hmm. because we have this agreement um, that we've each reached in our own way down our own paths. 
it's we're a part of this community and then the community is a check on us. And like when we were talking about the essence energies distinction, this is, I think, part of the reason why the Orthodox Church has a lot fewer dogmas than the Roman Catholic Church um, in terms of a different approach. The things that we've dogmatized, which are relatively few, are things that are aimed at, they have some practical import. It may not be immediately apparent, right? Like the essence energies distinction you could talk about all day without realizing the practical import. But when you get into when St. Gregory was arguing for it, you see, oh, no, this has a very practical thing, mm -hmm. right? Who is the person who truly knows God? The pious, uneducated monk or the, you know, scholastic, <laughs> right? That, that's an important question in the life of the church, right? Whose wisdom do you follow? The smartest guy in the room or the holiest guy in the room? Um, so uh, those things all have that practical import that impact how the community functions together. Um, that, you know, you... you and, and this, this butts up against sort of the broad culture that's deeply influenced by Protestantism. I can't count the number of times I've had somebody walk in the door of the church or send me an email without having ever walked in the door of the church or any Orthodox church and say, oh, I want to join the Orthodox church. I've read this book and that book and I listened to your podcast and I want to become Orthodox. And I'm like, you don't know that, right? Like you've never even been here. You know, you, you, you don't know what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. You've just mm -hmm. read these ideas and they appeal to you or you agree with them. And so that person gets told it for us, you have to come and live as a member of the community and attend the services and do all this for at least a year. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that year, we have a discussion about you being received into the church and you might not be ready yet. Right. Or, you know, there might be other issues that make us prolong it even longer than that. But the goal is that by the time that year is done, you're already sort of a member of the community. And we're just sort of actualizing that. And that's true whether you come in off the street and don't know what the Orthodox church is, or whether you've spent three years reading everything on the internet you could find <laughs> right? about about the Orthodox Church. Well, that that's one practical... list us where J. Dyer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's one practical way, I think, that we sort of subjugate that sort of intellectual belief approach, right, to the life of the community is by mm -hmm. saying, well, wait, <laughs> right? Come be part of the community first, right? Because one of the things I say over and over again is you don't join the Orthodox Church. You join an Orthodox church, a particular community in a particular place. And by virtue of being a member of that community, you're part of the Orthodox church mm -hmm. broadly, right? Um, yeah. So I guess, how do you view your uh, French Cajun Catholic neighbors? Because I would say that among things that are a culturally distinctive way of life in America, French Cajun-ness uh, is, is pretty distinctive. Southern Louisiana yeah. is one of the most unique places in the United States. So how, 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 do, how do you think about your, your Catholic neighbors? Well, yeah, and it is, it's very different even from the rest of the South. If you just drive north to Shreveport, everybody's a Baptist, right? You're in and you're they in the accent regular changes South. and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're in the regular South at that point. Um, but yeah, from, from Lafayette over to new Orleans, it's a different, including Baton Rouge. It's a different kind of thing. Um, so honestly, the, the Roman on a real practical level, the Roman Catholic church down here has been kind of devastated. Um, by uh, sex abuse scandals, all the scandals. Yeah. yeah. And the local bodies down here have been as involved in that as anybody. Um, and so the, the, the challenge I have is sometimes the other way in that um, we get a lot of Roman Catholic folks, especially more traditionally minded Roman Catholic folks who show up 
and maybe as refugees, you know. Um, and so in that case, catechesis looks very different. Um, catechesis then is, okay, we're not Roman Catholicism without the problems, right? Because um, number one, we have problems too. And number two, this is a different thing, right? This is a different... And it's not just the calendar's different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is not just a, a more conservative version of what you had before. Um, we're not just traditionalists, right? Um, so th that's a different thing. I, I do catechesis very differently. There, there are a lot of... This is one of my intra-Orthodox crusades is to get people to change how they do catechesis. There are still a lot of places where you go where catechesis is oh here's the seven ecumenical councils and here's the dates and here's what each one decided and, right here's this here's that um and first of all most of the people who have been orthodox their whole lives in any given parish don't know any of that um and it's very much taking that intellectual approach for me catechesis goes with it's more individualized and it's Okay, you're becoming part of the community. You're attending the services. What are the questions that are arising for you? What are the things you don't understand, either practically or in terms of the worship or in terms of the way we talk about things? Um, and then exploring those with the actual people. So I have, I have like a, a catechumen class, right? But every time we go through it, it's literally completely different. Um, because I don't really give lectures. I kind of yeah, <laughs> surprising me. <laughs> yeah, I, I address I address the actual people and where they're at and and what what they need because they're coming from all different all different kinds of backgrounds. So I'm I'm not actively going out trying to like convert everybody to orthodoxy and shut them down. Um, in fact. Uh, I'm a little difficult about that. So for example, when I do get that email with the person who says they want to become Orthodox, I delete it. I don't even respond. Um, they have to actually show up at the church in person <laughs> to even start having that conversation. Um, I, I make it a, a little difficult for people um, because um, another problem is sometimes people are sort of desperate. Like they take, oh, I've got these people converting to orthodoxy. Like that validates me. That validates my work in the community. That validates us. And then you end up, people come and join the church and then leave because it's not what they thought, right? Or uh, you have people come in with very problematic ideas, whether they're political ideas in one way or another or um, wanting to change the community and stuff. Um so yeah, it's it's very different. A lot of the Roman Catholic people who come and get confused because they're expecting like RCIA, and <laughs> there's <laughs> it's sort of the exact opposite, very individual and personalized and stuff, and about integrating them into the community and into our worship together. Follow up question: Earlier, you mentioned that the Orthodox Church has dogmatized fewer things. Yeah. And that you try and dogmatize things that make a difference. Um, this is a chronic recurring question that I've had in my head for a long time is what are the practical ramifications slash differences of my Christology and say mainstream Trinitarianism? And this has come up, you know, multiple times very personally, you know, like say if I'm getting excommunicated or something <laughs> like that. Um is like, so, you know, what what sin are you holding me at fault for precisely, right? Um, again, not saying I'm perfect, but, uh, and I have, you know, I grew up in a non-Trinitarian church, but I've spent a lot of time in Trinitarian churches, and I have a pretty large exposure to Catholicism, too. My mom's side of the family is Catholic, um, didn't have as much exposure to orthodoxy. There were some Greek kids in my class, as far as I could tell, orthodoxy was just Catholicism for Greek people um, who would take Greek classes. You know, the, the Jewish people in my school, okay, so they go to Hebrew school. The Catholic kids, they go to confirmation. The Greek kids, they go to Greek school. Um, and the Protestants, we go to like Boy Scouts. 
and um and but so real, spinning it back around um you know we talked a little bit about sort of um dc comic jesus versus marvel comic jesus right in terms of how much we could say try and understand him as a human with our you know limitations and capabilities versus him as something more of a, a, a ideal and that's a little bit perhaps some of the answer to the question but for the most part, in my wanderings around Christianity land, I couldn't really point to too much of a practical lived difference between a Trinitarian and a non-Trinitarian, other than if you get them talking about the particular subject. Like there are some questions, should you baptize infants or not? You know, okay, like I can, I can see the practical ramification of that question. That, that practical yeah. ramification is pretty obvious, you know. Um, should you speak in tongues or not? Okay, I can see the practical ramification of that question. Um, do you believe in the Trinity or not? Because it seemingly is so abstract, it seems hard to me to nail down anything other than perhaps some emphasis differences. But other than that, it would be hard for me to like look at someone's life and say, oh, that one's a Trinitarian, that one's a, a, a Unitarian, right? Does that make right. sense? So my yeah. question is, is what, what's the there there um, uh, for the Trinity? Right. So um, the first thing I have to say is it's, it's sometimes hard to isolate, right? So like you, you point at something in the orthodox way of life. Well, is that a result of this dogma or that dogma or that, right? Um, and approaching it that way is kind of the reverse of how it actually happened. Right, the way it actually happened, at least as I understand it, this may be a difference in our reading of history too. Um, I know you've at least read some of Religion of the Apostles, so I don't think these doctrines were actually constructed. I think they were described. Sort of what I was talking about earlier. How about yeah. when I'm yeah. answering your questions, I'm often looking in myself at what I probably already believe and trying to articulate it. Right, right, and so it's not that you know, before Nicaea, people didn't believe right? what Nicaea declared. There were plenty of people who already believed that it hadn't been articulated that particular way yet, right? Mm -hmm. I um, think most of the Trinitarian action action happens after Nicaea, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> um, but, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's what dogma, right, originally meant like a boundary marker, right? So the idea is here's the fence. It's also important that somebody isn't a heretic because they're wrong, right? Somebody is a heretic because they refuse correction. And the result of refusing that correction is that they're put outside the community, right? So you're teaching or doing something that we don't do in this community. So you need to either get in line with the community or not be part of the community, right? Like one of the two, right? Is, is sort of more what's being said. Right. So there's plenty of people who are in the community who are wrong <laughs> about various things. All of us are wrong about something. Right. Some things. Um, but so to me, I think the the but so there could be a disconnect. Right. I don't think every person in my parish. In fact, I think maybe my parish more than some others, just because of people listening to my podcasts and stuff, might be able to regurgitate something about the monarchical trinity or something. Um but certainly not everybody would pass the orthodox view of the Trinity test if you gave it to them. Um, and, and I think that fosters the view of a disconnect, right? Well, they're living this life anyway, even though they don't have that nailed down. So how can you say those are directly connected, right? But as humans, we're inconsistent all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, if I ask the average evangelical Protestant, do your works contribute to salvation? They'd say, absolutely not. And yet you see them giving to charity. You see them do it. And if you ask them why they're doing it, they'd say it's because they're a Christian. Yeah. Right? Fruits, <laughs> fruits worthy of repentance. Right. <laughs> so, right. So we're, we're all, you know, um, kind of inconsistent. The core thing with Christology, I think, is St. Gregory the Theologian saying, what isn't assumed isn't healed. And I think... That understanding of atonement that St. Athanasius really gets at 
the idea, and this is gets categorized as recapitulation to try and bring it in line with St. Irenaeus or however we want to categorize it, that uh, through God taking upon himself our human nature, our human nature itself is strengthened and transformed and revitalized. And then that giving us in the, again, in the Orthodox Church, at least, this therapeutic view of sin and repentance. And transformational view of sin and repentance. Now, your particular Unitarian view, you like you've incorporated theosis and you've incorporated some of those ideas, but I don't know that the average Unitarian person has. I don't even know who the well, average Unitarian person is. Excellent but. question. I'm not sure who the average Unitarian is. <laughs> and like I said, you know. My, my church growing up talked a lot about glorification and a strong emphasis yeah. on the resurrection and the kingdom to come and our transformation into that. Do we ever yeah. use the word theosis? No. When right. I had a conversation with my childhood pastor one time, I'm like, hey, the Orthodox have this idea called theosis. And I laid it out to him. He's like, oh, yeah. That sounds about right. You know, like that that sort of thing. So did we believe in theosis or did we not believe in theosis, yeah. right? Um, and I think it is relatively more common for Unitarians, at least the, the non-universalist, you know, uh, main right. line ones, right? To some have of whom are atheists, yeah. Some of whom are atheists, some of whom are California Buddhists, right? Yeah. Or, or whatever. You know, um, I think among, say, biblical or Christian Unitarians, I think that it is relatively common. And the most famous Unitarian, William Ellerly Channing, who has a big statue of himself in the Boston public garden. He, one of his most famous sermons is likeness unto God, which is about how all of these Puritans around us have misunderstood the point. The point is for us to become like unto God. And, you know, okay. So that, that, that's theosis. He, he didn't have that word, but it was the same idea. And so I think it is relatively more common among Unitarians to have something like glorification or theosis as a very heavy emphasis. Does that translate to a kind of therapeutic view of sin and repentance? Um, or is it more in the Protestant mold of maybe not full-on penal substitutionary atonement, but, you know, sin as, you know, violation of a commandment, violation of a rule? Um, I mean, good question. I think it could... And again, like it's basically impossible to take speak on behalf of Unitarians right, because right. it's such a disparate group. And you know, Anthony Buzzard's pretty different than even say me or Dale Tuggy on yeah. you know certain questions. Even though we can go to conferences together and get along pretty well, um, and you know, I, 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 most Unitarians have recently come out of Trinitarian Biblicist Protestantism and still have a lot of that in them. And so they tend to have a very still sort of forensic-ish, you know, um, view yeah. of, of sin. Well, that may be part of the issue with this question, right? Because, no. I mean, I equally, I can't speak for everybody who identifies as a Trinitarian, right? Right, <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Because and... it's, it's, it's Trinity plus all the other, plus the whole package. Right. Well, and even my view of the Trinity, right, the, the Orthodox view of the Trinity and the way I in particular understand it. But even if we just take the Orthodox view, right, as articulated in creeds and stuff, it's not identical to the Roman Catholic view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Protestant churches have all kinds of things, right? You get to Calvin, he's got the son is the say, right? I mean, like yeah, it goes yeah. all kinds of places. So, and, and then on the other side, I think, what I'm getting from you and what I get from you in, in a lot of the talks you give is that I think, I don't know if Unitarianism is a thing yet, right? In the sense that it's a category, but I think it's a category with a lot of diversity within it. Yeah, it's like saying premillennialism, right? Or something right. like that, you know? Okay, so even if I got you to admit that Irenaeus was in fact a premillennialist, he's still very different than a dispensational premillennialist. Right. Right. And so saying, you know, I don't know if we know yet how, if there comes to be like, and I know there's some who don't even want this, but if there came to be a biblical Unitarian denomination where 
all of this stuff was theologically worked out by the best minds <laughs> right? who hold to that view. And then communities were formed based on that. And those communities lived and existed for a couple generations. I think we could point then at the life of that community and compare it to the life of another no. Trinitarian I mean, community of a specific type. There and are better able to isolate this, right? There <laughs> are some old Trinitarian, old Unitarian churches in Transylvania. They, uh, the, 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 this is the oldest continually operating one, right? There, the, there was a friend of Michael Servetus who was a doctor who had learned his theology from Michael Servetus and then became the court doctor, basically, of a prince in Transylvania. And this prince of Transylvania was interested in becoming Protestant. And so he had like a Calvinist, a Lutheran, and this Unitarian doctor friend of his all give competing presentations and sales pitches of what should this um, princedom of Transylvania be. And the Unitarians won. And the, the whole kingdom then became Unitarian and was for a few generations. And then, um, you know, wars and stuff like that. And, you know, some Calvinists come back and, you know, and then like, yeah, Transylvania has had a rough history. It's now part of Romania, but most of the time it was part of Hungary. And then it was communist. Yeah. Right. And, and so, yeah. so the, the, the Unitarians have been through their, their paces, but there's still a few hundred thousand, I think, Unitarians that are about almost 500 years old now in that part of Transylvania. Um, and they actually, I'm pretty sure that you could even argue they have apostolic succession in the sense that I'm pretty sure that the Bishop of Transylvania became Unitarian and they still have an Episcopal church structure with a, a head bishop and all that sort of thing. But I'm not sure exactly what the total difference is between, I would have to know more about them between say the Transylvanian Unitarians and the Transylvanian Calvinists, Right. Right. Um, or, or, you know, comparing a Romanian Orthodox church, right. 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 Parish to that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, that, that might be one approach to it, but even then you'd be comparing a specific sort of version of Unitarianism, Unitarian right. church life to a particular version of Trinitarian church life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. If I had to give something like my answer to the question, that I've observed is what practical difference does it make in a certain sense in the life of an average sort of American evangelical biblicist Protestant, not a ton, yeah. but in the overall picture, I think that, and you kind of touched on this is that I think that the Trinity has a way of engendering a sense of intellectual submission to the church because it is complicated and hard to understand, and then perhaps at some final level, mysterious. It has this sort of sense of the highest rung of theology is for the experts, and that this is something that the common folk have to kind of believe and trust in. And that I think that it, it is in a certain sense, I actually think that at some level, Biblicist Protestantism is incompatible with Trinitarianism, because... But I could give historical reasons for that, and I could say you can't sow a scripture your way into the Trinity. But I think that because it elevates individual reason and discussion and interpretation, that it doesn't like this idea that there's something that only the experts should get to understand and teach, right? And I would say, so maybe it's just sort of a clericalism or a, a clerical ecclesiology that I think melds well with Trinitarianism and conversely yeah. the opposite. Yeah, I think we would disagree with the West about who the experts are, like St. Gregory mm -hmm. Palamas that we were talking about earlier. Right. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I, th I think that's, and I think... I think that's true with Protestantism in this sense. Um, not just that I don't think school, soul scriptura works at all, but that's, um, but in the sense that, and I think we talked about this a little in, in email, is that th there is this sort of odd thing, and it's become odder because you know e evangelical Protestantism in the United States is down the road from the Reformation, a good ways. Mm -hmm. um, where 
there's this weird quasi privileging of certain early creeds and not others. Yeah. Right. So, yes. <laughs> and, and <laughs> You're telling me. No internally consistent within Protestantism reason to say, well, no, you have to accept the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. You have to accept Ephesus, at least in part. We're not big on that whole Theotokos thing because, you know, that sounds Catholic to us. Mm -hmm. um, but and, if you twisted and, our arm, we would agree with it, but we will yeah. never say it. Yeah. And, and Chalcedon, okay, yeah, that one you have to have too. But then everything after that you can forget about and not worry about. Um, and <laughs> but like, and we'll throw the questions. Athanasian Creed in there too for whatever yeah. reason that is. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and they'll always say, right, well, those are secondary standards, right? And, but but definitely, definitionally within that, they're ref quote unquote reformable according to scripture. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think functionally that center cannot hold because I don't see a reason to be dedicated to the Lutheran tradition or the Calvinist tradition even if you think Luther and Calvin were spot on in their time and place in the 16th century, why would that be normative in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. What's the Westminster confession have to do with me? Right. Right. What, what authority right. does that actually hold over? Uh, me? Now, if you have, I mean, the, the, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox positions are more internally consistent on that score. I would agree. Right. Cause it's, you know, if it's all or nothing, then all and nothing are your only two options, not somewhere in between. Right. right. And it yeah. can be updated because like, OK, so, you know, it wasn't like the Council of Nicaea decided upon way more stuff than just the Nicene Creed. Right. You know, uh, in terms of ecclesiology, the, canons, the, date, yeah. the, can, the date of Easter and, yeah, you know, how uh, church discipline and, you know, a whole bunch of different things were decided upon right. at the Council of Nicaea. So why do you only care about the Christological aspect? Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and then and 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 now we're even in a phase in evangelicalism, which is weird. Where some people can get away with murder, like William Lane Craig gets away with murder. He rejects the Trinity and Orthodox Christology. Yep, right. I I've commented many times. William Lane Craig is fractally wrong. Like every single area of theology. Like he doesn't get the Trinity or Christology right from my perspective. And he also believes in penal substitutionary atonement. I'm like, what? <laughs> why? You know, like these things don't even make sense to get. He's a Molinist, like he's some weird Jesuit medieval, right? Because he can't be a Calvinist or an Arminian like a normal person. I, but, <laughs> and just sort of his celebrity and the perception of him as a really smart person lets him sort of get away with that. And the fact that people have forgotten these distinctives, right? They yeah. wouldn't they wouldn't know why Apollinarianism wasn't in accordance with the Council of Chalcedon, right? Yeah. Um and and, and yeah, and I don't even understand how William Lane's Craig William Lane Craig's version of the Trinity could allow him to recite the Nicene Creed in good faith. Because yeah. 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 I I don't talk about this stuff in my past much, but just to give one example. At one point when I was taking classes at Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I suggested in a class that if someone didn't, didn't believe in the contents of the Nicene Creed, that they, they weren't a Trinitarian, right? <laughs> That's, and was laughed at. Because the president at the time was a social Trinitarian and was pushing mm -hmm. social Trinitarianism. Right. So that was revisable in that way, but not in other ways. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure they would have had a big problem with your view. Right? Yeah. Right. I, yes, they do. But, but, but yeah. Social Trinitarianism was apparently fine. And I'm like, well, wait, why is that fine? That's well, because social Trinitarianism is Trinitarianism. And the only important part of the Nicene Creed is that it teaches, teaches Trinitarianism. Okay. So as long and as so, you can call it some so kind of Trinitarianism. You can, you can shoehorn yourself in that way. And it's part of me is like, you know, maybe I just need to label my theology a form of Trinitarianism. Yeah. Subordinationist and, Trinitarianism or something. Subordinationist mere man Trinitarianism, right? And uh, 
<laughs> and they'll be like, oh, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. You're a Trinitarian. That's good. <laughs> right. And that's sort of my point that it's a weird sort of submission to something. Yeah. Even for the Protestants for that, that believe in it, this sort of sense that there's some unbreakable link in the chain that needs to be maintained and that be, you need to be Trinitarian in some sense, even if you're a William Lane Craig partialist, modalist, something, another. Yeah, Cerberus. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, that's fine because there's still some sort of bowing of the knee to this larger thing that, and I think it was because a lot of the magisterial reformers wanted to actually reform Rome. Yeah. And that they were hoping that once upon, you know, sometime in the future, Rome would be like, actually, you guys were right. Okay. We're sorry. Here's a new council. We're going to accept a lot of your proposals. And then Luther or Calvin would be like, great, we find this acceptable. We now re-enter communion, right? Yeah. And they knew that that would be impossible with breaking the Trinity. And that's why Servetus was uh, such a lightning rod is because he was offering the propositional opposite path, right? Like, no, it's unreformable. It, we have to go in a direction that will preclude us ever rejoining. And I think that that was really sort of the, the real difference between magisterial and, refer and radical Protestantism. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've noticed in talking to just contemporary American Protestants that, that they, don't, they don't experience that desire the same way the reformers did right no. like no matter what the roman catholic church did <laughs> they would feel no onus to like de-schism right to like <laughs> go back to it mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um no matter what right so yeah yeah and and i think part of that is yeah the creeds and confessions that were produced to define things. Well, here's where we think Rome has it wrong. And other than this, we think they generally have it right. Um, became ends in themselves. No, no. Yeah, no, this is the statement of the timeless truth, right? This is exactly what St. Paul thought, <laughs> right? In, in the first century. Mm -hmm. And I, whereas radical Protestantism had just a different idea and goal altogether. Yeah. And I feel like America basically is just radical Protestantism put into both religious and even I would say political instantiation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. The Anabaptists seem to have held on to much more of the view of a way of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You get a lot more of that with like Mennonite, obviously the Amish, but I mean, Mennonites and, and yeah. Quakers, right. There's more of a less, set, less based on propositional beliefs. Right. And the Unitarians were sort of the radical propositionalists, right? The the Amish, I mean, Amish are basically a Trinitarian. They don't really believe in the Trinity, but they're not going to make a big stink about saying that they don't. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. don't care yeah. about the Trinity. They're a Trinitarian, yeah. not non-Trinitarian. The Unitarians were, no, we are explicitly propositionally non-Trinitarian, and we're fine with that because we're doing the Sola Scriptura thing. We're doing the new thing. And yeah. you you... Lutherans and Calvinists are in this weird halfway no man's land. Yeah. Anyway, I should get going pretty soon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've been at uh, it for a while. We've been at it for a while. Any any last things you want to say? No, I think it was, it's been good having this conversation. I'm glad it was a conversation. Yeah, we didn't even, I, I was pretty sure we were going to talk about icons at some point, but um, <laughs> we'll have to save that for some other time. We touched because, on it very vaguely and briefly, but yeah. Very vaguely and briefly, but okay. So maybe some other time we'll, we'll get into it on icons and Mary. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. But anyway, Father Stephen DeYoung, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>